Simon Hamilton is a seasoned creative who's taken his interior design talent and translated it into a multifaceted career that includes interiors, recruitment, training and youth mentoring at the world-renowned Central St. Martins, to name a few. And of course, he owns his own design agency. Simon's passion is to provide positive examples, new opportunities, good role models and memorable experiences to create a clearer pathway into the industry for the black, Asian and minority ethnic population. So let's hear more about Simon's endeavours. Welcome Simon to the Designer Arty Podcast Studio. Before, before we continue, yeah. icebreaker. Yeah. Tell me something about you, or show me something that I might not necessarily, and those listening might not necessarily associate with you. Okay. Who is Simon Hamilton? I am an avid fan of electric cars and electric bikes. Um, I'm somebody who's always liked transport, a bit geeky, I suppose. Um, something perhaps I haven't gone on about, but yeah, I love traveling and trains, planes, automobiles. But now more than ever, um, I would always try to travel with the environment in mind and think about how getting there. Um, so I've been living in France for the last year and a half. Which part of France? South of France, near Avignon. So me and my partner, we went over there before Brexit and all the rest of it, wanted to be part of Europe. Um, and we only went, came back and forth by train. We didn't fly because it was just really important. In fact, I had to fly two weeks ago and I was feeling guilty, but I was going to Greece and working out, going by train or boat was just going to take too long. So the environment does matter to me a lot. That's something that he might know, but in terms of my travel, yes. And there's a conundrum with the electric cars in the south of France. They don't have the range yet to get there, do they? Oh, uh, well, it's not quite as simple as that. They do in some ways. I mean, I went to see my brother who was living in France at the time about three years ago and I hired a Tesla and it was one of the best, um, I would say, road trips I've ever done. It's about 1,500 kilometres all round and we had a Model S. It was in December, so yes, the range was affected because the electric cars don't like the cold, especially particularly that cold. But it was incredibly relaxing and amazing. And the roads in France are fantastic, particularly the toll roads. Did you find charging stations okay? Uh, yes, we did. There's an after app, a little, isn't there? yeah, after a little bit of a glitch because we were feeling quite smug. We you know, went over on Eurotunnel and then at Calais we should have recharged, but we didn't. And then we had a, a sort of awkward moment when we couldn't get very far. I had to turn everything off, but then we, you know, managed to get to the next charging station. After that, it was just pure bliss. Fantastic. So I love using electric cars. Okay. So some people might know that because, I, in fact, it's contrary to what I did before because I used to belong to the classic car club, which is all about petrol, petrol and emissions and cars that are belching out lots of smoke and things like that so um i suppose maybe it's an antidote to that and that car club is now closing as a car club but they're still going to operate as uh, you know housing cars and garaging them but that was a great experience so I dr i've driven lots of cars like bentley's rolls royces aston martins minis triumph heralds i know far too much about cars i used to go to the motor show every year even on my own as a kid i loved it now i want to hear about how you got into interiors Let's talk about that. Okay. Well, in some ways it's quite straightforward because I went to a good school. That's a whole other story in itself. But I went to a good school and at my school they had a careers convention. And during that con careers convention, I must have been, I suppose, 15, 16, 14, something like that, I met an American landscape architect and she was telling me about architecture as being a great career my sister I've got two sisters and two brothers uh, my elder sister she was living and working in America in San Francisco for some architects so I got interested in the built environment in that way I used to build little houses out of shoe boxes I remember that nobody taught me how to do that it was just a thing I just did a passion you had yeah so I can think it's always been there I think some of my family is fairly creative in some ways, but not taking it through to be a career. And long story short, I went to Middlesex, I did a foundation course, I particularly liked interiors, and then I went to Nottingham to do my degree. 
I love Nottingham. I have a real soft spot for it. And I'm really glad that I left London. People were thinking I was mad then. Why leave London? There's lots of other things that are happening in London. There's nowhere else to go. And I thought, well, actually, there are other places to go. So I was really glad that I went to the heart of the country. And then I was able to visit places that I probably wouldn't have gone to if I had been in London. So Sheffield, Loughborough, Derby, um, Newcastle, all those sort of places um, that became more important to me. And after I did my degree, I came back to London, worked in a number of different offices and... Doing what? Mainly commercial interiors, so offices and um, spaces like that. And that was really good. It was a sort of boom time. And then redundancy came along, which wasn't such a bad thing. It was the early 90s. And for five years from then, I worked as a freelance interior designer, which was great because I got lots of experience by working in different companies. And you see how companies operate, you learn from that, and you also grow your network. So you, um, it did me a lot of favours. You, you learn a lot in that way. How's the transition from going to being an employer to, no, wait a minute. What? Employee to, Employee to being self-employed. I loved it. I really, I was ready, ready for it. I wasn't happy in the job I was at at that time. So redundancy was a favour to me in a way. And looking back, it was because of discrimination. At the time, I didn't really realise it. Um, the company was a good company, but the, the people that I was working with, or one person in particular, she was quite um, difficult, <laughs> to say mm -hmm. the least. So I was quite happy to be leaving there. And when I look back, I think, well, yeah, there was the things that happened to me weren't really good. And I didn't really complain about it. But that wouldn't be allowed now at all. It was we sort of bullying, basically. Can, can you share more? Um, it wasn't it wasn't anything in particular. It was just a, a continuous sort of putting down and not being allowed to flourish and not being encouraged. And she had favourites. And you could see that those favourites would got all the opportunities. I remember what particularly there was one situation where I was meant to go on a trip to a supplier's factory and she deliberately decided I wasn't going to go, but one of my colleagues was going to go. And that really hurt at the time because I really was excited to go. It was fantastic as a, a young designer to be able to go somewhere and, and see how things were made and manufactured and distributed. And I still haven't been to that supplier space as well. Um, the good thing that has come out of it is that it's given me more confidence. I wouldn't deal with such a person in the same way now. Um, and the person that was one of her favourites is still a good friend of mine. So it didn't actually ruin that relationship. Um, but going to freelance work after being in a permanent job, I found it quite easy because I'm somebody that's quite sociable, I can talk to people quite easily, and it gave me lots more confidence. So me sort of moving around to different companies really helped in that sense. And, um, and it was the right sort of time to do it. Mm, it takes a lot of courage. It does, but I think I've always had great friends and, um, you know, support family, my partner. So I didn't feel kind of worried about it. It was it was like a new adventure. It was almost like this is meant to happen for a reason and I'm moving on and it's another chapter. Quite and fateful. Yeah, exactly. Fatalistic. I, yeah, I believe in that. That whole bullying uh, chat is an interesting one because the benefit of hindsight, what I heard you saying is actually in that moment, I didn't realise. Yeah that it was wrong, yeah. but with the benefit of hindsight, yeah. is that what you're saying? Yeah, except there was one situation, I think it was when I was, when I was sort of called into a room to be told I was going to be made redundant, and they said, oh, we're really disappointed in you. <laughs> and I thought that actually, well, what were you expecting? I don't know, if I'd been told what to do, how to perform in the job in terms of my creativity or whatever I, else I, I needed to do, I might have responded differently. Um, oh, so, that's so interesting. Yeah. So what you were asking for, what you're asking for now that you didn't know to ask for then was actually, if you just told me more honestly what you wanted, I could have done it. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, guidance, support, nurturing, all those things are really important because as a, a designer that has just recently qualified and you're going into a workplace, you don't know lots of things. So you need to be helped you need to be guided you need to be supported by people that are senior to you not bullied by them not put down by them and not sort of um 
I don't know, made to be feel guilty because you haven't performed to what their expectations are, especially when you don't know what their expectations were. So, so in so going freelance for me was just like okay, that's the antidote. But even even now, when I'm talking to different people and advising them on their careers, I think okay, a permanent job may seem a better situation, but actually, you're only four weeks away from being you know, not permanent. So it is almost like a freelance role. I don't see a permanent job as any more secure, particularly now, than a freelance position. That's such an interesting nuance. Just a slight adjustment with your thinking. It's about approach, yes, because, of course, you know, you may have benefits in a full-time role. Of course, if you work for a company, there's... I don't know, childcare, healthcare, there's uh, cycle to work, there's all sorts of incentives and things like that. And you have colleagues and you may have training in the company, etc. Um, but there are benefits of being a freelance designer as well, such as the freedom to choose and who you work with, where you work, what you do, and um, what career path you pursue. And also now more than ever, I would say, people are working in different roles, they're doing different jobs that maybe complement each other so you can have that freedom. So I suppose that's where I'm at now. I do a number of different things that complement each other. Mm, interesting. Yeah, you're flexible. You're, you're, you're adaptable to yes, change. It's taken a long time. I just want to put a pin in the conversation yeah. about the, the bullying. So for anybody listening to, listening to this that, that, that that's resonating with, I'm wondering if you could share your greatest learning from that experience. I would say that I would learn to speak up for myself. I would also um, perhaps get support. I didn't get any support. I didn't speak to HR. I didn't really know that you could do that. I suppose I wasn't aware. I was probably too scared because the person was senior. I was seen as a junior or just another employee in a very small team, but a lovely team. And some of those people, again, are still good friends of mine. But I didn't know where to go for um, for help. And I suppose it is, it seems really obvious now, you go for help if you've got a problem. But not when you're young. Not when you're young. Well, well, there's no career. internet, there's no social media, there's no sort of network. And I would, if I was looking at myself now, I'd say, well, no, don't put up with that sort of behaviour or that treatment. Um, go and speak to somebody who's more senior than the person who was treating you like that and have a discussion about it. Um, And I've more recently, I suppose perhaps in the last three years, been in a situation where I've worked for an employer and I was the whole person that was having to listen to somebody else that had a situation. They felt that they were not being bullied, but it was an uncomfortable work situation. So I was the person that was sort of taking the notes and the witness, etc. So I do understand what it's like to be on the other side and people can feel very frustrated. But I think there are the channels and the platforms to be able to speak about it now, which is fantastic and essential. So it's interesting that a not very nice situation, if I can use that phrase, has propelled you into actually something that's more suited for you. Yeah. The freelance world. Yeah. So here we are. It has. And I suppose that I've... I know it sounds a cliche, but I've got strength from it because I think I don't want to be treated like that anymore or again, or I don't want to see other people like that. And I suppose I've done that subconsciously. I'm perhaps doing it more consciously now. Over the years, I've been in other roles where I went into recruitment for a few years because... I Interiors got, recruitment. Yeah, I got tired of design, if that sounds Oh, done. Sorry, but it's just because I was working freelance and then it just seemed really, really repetitive. There was no creativity. There was no growth. There was no development. So I thought this isn't really where I want to be. And I went to a a recruitment agency that was one of the the most um, respected. And it also was one of the first in the interior sector. And I had a fantastic time. I had a time to convince them that I was right for the role. But then I said, well, I've just been freelancing for five years. So I know lots of your clients. I know what those offices and studios are like. So when I'm talking to candidates, I can genuinely say, this is what it will be like when you work there. This is the person you'll work with, et cetera, et cetera. And I worked in recruitment for, what was it, three years initially in that company. And I absolutely loved it. Why were you a good recruiter? Well, that's that's a different thing. I wasn't necessarily a good recruiter. I was good with people. 
So I I didn't make loads of money for the company like other people did, but I was good at listening and good at talking to candidates and reassuring them about their skills and their experience, etc. And yes, the market was good, so it wasn't that difficult to recruit. But then I I went out of recruitment. I went back to it even you know a few years later, and then I realised no, I'm not the person who's going to make you know fifty thousand. Um, in terms of you know a placement per month, there were people that I was had as colleagues who were just bringing in that sort of money, and that wasn't me. And I thought, no, but I'm somebody that can listen to people, and I can understand their perspective because I've been an employer and I've been an employee. I've been out of work and I've been looking for work. I kind of seen it from all sides, and because I've been in recruitment for so long, I've seen hundreds, literally CVs and portfolios. And I know what it's like when people go to interviews and their expectations, and I can see it from either side. So um, I realised that the career mentoring side is much more me because it's caring about people and giving them advice where I can sort of listen to their particular perspective because everybody has their own angle, their own issues and um, needs some sort of support. So I do a lot of that through Design Career Consulting, which is an agency I did set up specifically for career advice and that specifically is for young people not necessarily for young people it's for anybody it's for anybody because um who's using the service it is it's a range of people there are people who run their own companies who who want some advice and that's mentoring um and they could be in need of advice as to how to run their company um there was somebody i i saw as a client um and you know they were doing very well but they were almost doing too much in terms of how much they were charging. So it was giving them some sort of guidance. And then there are young people that have just graduated or people who have graduated for two, three years you know, in the past and can't get a job at all. And it could just be down to the fact that their cover letter is way too long. They've got the wrong approach. Their portfolio doesn't really excite or um, stand out. So a range of people. And then there are, are designers who've been working for a few years, but they really want to sort of see where they're at um, in the marketplace and how can they get up to the next level if they are in a company or what do they do if they want to start their own agency. So a real mixture of people and I also work with the universities, a lot of universities. I think you just love humans and I think you find so much value in the human race. I think so, yes. Mm. yeah, yeah. That's your thing. I think you're right because, as I said, it's taken a long time. I've come to this point now where everything I do is human-centric, um, whether it's working with United in Design um, and helping them, and, and that's a fantastic charity that's been set up to help disadvantaged designers who haven't had an opportunity to work in industry and set up a fantastic apprenticeship programme. Uh, remi- say that again. United in Design. Yeah. Which is set up by um, and Sophie you're active. Ash- yes, set up by Sophie Ashby and Alexandria Dawley during 2020, and it was really in a res- in response to to give designers that might come from Black, Asian, ethnic minority backgrounds um, opportunity to work for design practices. So what they have done has been extremely successful. We're now coming to the end of the very first year of the apprenticeship program. And the apprenticeship program allows, it's lived, there's five apprentices that have been given a job each in four different practices in one year and paid a salary of 22,000 pounds. And those designers haven't worked in design practices full-time before on a long-term basis. So now they are very experienced and ready to go and some of them are staying on and we're about to launch the next apprenticeship program. So I help with that in terms of the career side, in terms of advising those um, applicants and writing some of the copy on the the website which gives advice about CVs, portfolios, etc. That's life changing. Yes, yes. So they all, five of them have full time career. So five of them have been working full time, yeah. And it's been amazing because those practices are practices that they may have aspired to work for but had no way in. So now they've been able to work there and their suppliers as well. So um, we've been able to create this as a, a whole team of people, which is fantastic. And the, what Sophie and Alex have done, they've, they've kind of opened up the industry. The industry has realised that then there needs to be more opportunity, more representation. And, and they've created that almost from nothing, from a sort of standing zero. Um, 
so I'm involved with them. And as you say, I'm very people centric. So my work as a career advisor has come through all the experience I've gained over the years working as a recruiter and then working in design companies as a recruiter internally. So dealing with agencies from the outside. And then also um, when I had my own design agency initially and I needed somebody to help work with me, I had an advert and a person applied. And the thing that he said in his application that really struck a chord with me and I took him on and he's still a good friend of mine now um, was I'm not quite what you're looking for. So that was a good approach because he'd read the brief and he thought, oh, okay, I'm not that, but I'll still apply. I'll take a chance. And he ended up working with me and he's now set up his own company. He's very successful. Matteo Bianchi, his name is. And, uh, and we're good friends. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you don't have to have a conventional approach to be successful. It's just about being yourself. Which is your favourite part of the job? Gosh, I would say, I mean, you can tell I can talk a lot, but I like listening. <laughs> um, I like meeting new people and finding out what their sort of genuine passion is, why why they're motivated to do what they do. Um, because it's it's interesting that a lot of the people I meet, and this happens nearly across the board, no matter what age people are, people are quite shy about showing off about their skills. And they, I say Is to them, that a this British thing. No, it's just everybody, basically. Most people, I would say, people will leave things out. And I think, well, you need to say that because nobody will know that unless you tell them. Um, and it could be language skills, it could be software skills, it could be just soft skills, it could be things that are transferable from another career. And they don't think it's relevant, but it needs to be told so that they can be, you know, individuals. So interesting, but we are told as children, aren't we? Be modest. <laughs> well, I think that's changed now. I think Don't speak. Let other people speak before <laughs> you. Don't yeah. butt in. I see in, there's so many kids who are doing selfies now. Uh, I think that's really changed. Social media has really given people confidence in some ways. Um, but you would, advocate, you would advocate flying your own flag, sharing your accomplishments. Yes, yes. So when I advise people about their CVs, I always say that, um, you know, in your CV, you need to really get across in the first half of the first page the most important things about you. So not just how to contact you and where you're from, um, but also what drives you, who, what your personality is, and your perhaps core competencies or your career highlights. And those career highlights may not be your career highlights, they may be just highlights in your life. So whether you've climbed up the Himala Himalayas, you've done a marathon, you've written a book, you've um, cooked for 4,000 people, whatever, those sort of things are going to resonate because people want to know in your CV about you, not just what you're going to bring and how you're going to fit into a team, but also how you might be an asset and that you're going to bring some sort of personality and individuality. That's great advice. And how long should that section be? Well, as I say, it has to be like the first half of the first page. The reason I say that is because lots of recruiters and employers scan CVs. So you have to get the information across very quickly. So you're only talking about a couple of paragraphs. You know, you know write a good pro profile that's two paragraphs maybe and introduce yourself. And then the core competencies and highlights could be, you know, another two paragraphs. But they could be just bullet points, actually. Are we on two sides with the CV still? I would say maximum two sides, yeah. I've been working in the industry for over three decades, and my CV is only two pages. I've had to edit a lot. And some people I see try to squeeze <laughs> everything onto one page. Teeny writing. <laughs> yeah, the writing's too small. They're really not doing themselves justice. And they have a lot more to offer than they think. So... You know, two two pages maximum. It varies, though, because if you're in Europe, you're expected to put down lots of things about your qualifications, have a photograph of yourself, and there's lo lots of different things that are expected. But if you're in the UK, that's an absolute no, though. People will be put off if you put a photograph of yourself on the CV. Isn't it's a that cultural thing. fascinating? Yeah, because I did the circuit in New York, or the TV circuit, and they wanted a picture, and my agent said, no age. Yeah. I said, I don't care if people know how 49 and three quarters. Do not put your age. Yeah, 
Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So, so discrimination is alive and kicking. It is, it is. Uh, but it's also, I suppose, expectations and, and different countries operate in different ways. Yeah. Um, so in the UK, no picture? No photograph of yourself, no. Your it's, age? You don't have to put your age at all, no. And in fact, people shouldn't judge you against, you know, by your age, that's discrimination anyway. Mm. Um, but I always suggest that people put language skills, they put, should put their nationality, be proud of your nationality. It really matters because it could matter in terms of what the company does and where they're located and the type of projects they do. And your right to stay and work in the UK, particularly important. And also your contact details. It sounds obvious, but some people forget to put their email or their phone number. Good you want, advice. You want people to be able to contact you. And also don't undersell yourself. So if you have just graduated, don't just say graduate interior designer. You just say interior designer. You've qualified. So you need to be able to, in a way, sell yourself. But it's not like selling. It's, it's just being confident about what you're offering and who you are. I'm, what I'm hearing from you and you're reminding me is speak your truth. Just be confident with who you are. Yeah. Stand in those shoes and own it. Yeah. And it's easier to do it when you're older. My age, yes. But when I was younger, no. And I think that's what people do um, have as a disadvantage when you're younger is that they're not necessarily as confident because they haven't had these experiences to build on. Yes, um, but whereas... then they've got you, Simon <laughs> Hamilton. Well, hopefully. Mentor, coach. Yeah. But now I would say... I know myself better than ever, but that has happened in the last five years. It's taken a long time. And I think it's also because there are things that I would say no to that I wouldn't have said no to before. When I was working as a designer and I had my own consultancy and I used to employ freelance designers, I would take on any project. Now, when I'm working as an interior designer, I am very specific about who I work with. And that's because I'm lucky enough to have other things going on, but also... I'm not doing a project just because I need the work desperately. I'm doing a project because I love it. Because you love it. What yeah. do you love? Dream project. I've got a project in Europe. I can't talk about it too much, but that in some ways is a, a dream project. It's a commercial project. Commercial. So it's also working with somebody else. My colleague, he's based in Portugal. So it's international. Is it something to do with learning? No, not at all, actually. Um, no, it's commercial, it's international, and it's collaborative. So in that sense, it's a dream project. But also the other reason I suppose it is a dream project is because I always ask myself, and I give this advice to other people when they're talking, talking about projects or considering them, it ticks, and these are very specific boxes, and I'm not ashamed to say they're boxes. There are three boxes that a project would tick for me, and if it ticks two of those out of three, it's great. Are you doing it for the money? Are you doing it for the experience? Or are you doing it for your portfolio? Absolutely. So are you doing it to get paid, which is fine, you need to live. If you're doing it to, for the experience because it's not a project you've done before, or you want to build in your experience, that's always going to be good. You're like going to learn things. If you're doing it for your portfolio, because you can put it in your portfolio and be proud of it and show it to people and get more work from it, that's also great. And you'll learn and build on your portfolio. So. If you have all three, you're laughing. Mm. If you have two out of those three, whatever two they are, you're also laughing. So when you don't have those, then you know, again, like you said, it's fate. You're thinking, mm, there's something not right about this project. I'm not really going to learn anything. Um, this is not something I want to show people. They're not even paying me for it. So, you know, to move on and not say yes. Um, but that took me a while. And I learned that from somebody else, an architect friend. And she said that. And I thought, well, that's a really good rule to have because it just simplifies everything, every single project that comes to you. Lovely. Um, so if you're going to learn from it and you're going to put it in your portfolio, then do it. Who are the mentors you have around you? Oh, gosh, I suppose there's, there's quite a few different people, actually. I would say there are people that I that might not see themselves as mentors, but um, they are indirectly... Um, Daniel Garver, he might be surprised to hear that. He's a, I would say he's a mentor. Um, he's somebody I admire. Why is he surprised? Well, I suppose because I haven't told him he is. <laughs> um, it's not that he gives me direct advice. He's somebody that I respect. I like what he's doing um, and the way he's doing it. And What do you um, like about him? I suppose he's good with people, actually. He's charismatic. He's charming. He's funny. Um, he's definitely international. Um 
and uh and he's yeah he, he's got a really nice personality you know he's not tainted by it he could be he could be somebody that's really full of himself and he so isn't um and i like that you like actually. humility yeah i do mm. like a bit of humility and um and not false humility um i would say lee broom he's he's uh in in some ways he's a great mentor he's somebody that i've had the chance to speak to work with in ways in terms of doing talks and again he's very humble but he's also extremely talented um generous and somebody that's got um you know a lot a lot going for him yeah i really like him i would say somebody i haven't really met that is definitely an idol of mine would be um gosh his name's gone from my mind now is um Jaime Hayon I've been to talks that he's done he's a Spanish designer but he's more of an artist but he's fantastic very humble very very talented somebody how have, so creative from a creative perspective very creative mm. yeah he's designed so many furniture ranges and lighting ranges for all sorts of huge brands but still remains a, a person that you feel is um, just quite humble in the way he thinks and and approaches life, basically. Mm. Um, and a, a definite icon is Paul Smith. That has come from a number of different things. Because I studied at Nottingham, um, I think that's when I first discovered Paul Smith. I remember going to his shop. I couldn't afford anything, but I used to go there every Saturday. I think a friend of mine worked there. And... I'm wearing Paul Smith now, actually. Mm. Um, so I've become loyal in every way. I met him when he did a talk at the Design Museum, which wasn't that long ago. And he was so generous in what he was saying, the advice he was giving to people. Um, and there were a lot of people who were in fashion who were in, at that talk as well. And then I bought his book. I did the whole thing, queued up, got his autograph, etc. cetera. Um, really great, amazing guy. Um, fascinating and I'm into cycling as well so you know big fan of that you you ooze inclusivity collaboration collaboration I love I love working with other people yeah that's something that is really important to me I've done a talk or two talks about it um, in fact that was with Matteo again about how if you collaborate with somebody you're they're not competition they're somebody you're going to learn from you'll probably do a better job um, I've had a bad collaboration in the past but that was perhaps because I was naive and ex expectations were wrong. Um, it cost me more. It was a, having a stand. <laughs> it cost me more to collaborate than it did on doing it on my own. Um, but it wouldn't put me off doing that in the future, perhaps. So, yes, I do like collaborating. I think it's really important. And I, I enjoy seeing other people's methods and learning from them and sharing what I know as well and then coming out with something completely different. Mm. So what's your involvement with BIID? Uh, my involvement with them has been very long and enjoyable. I used to be international director for BIID, um, which was fantastic. It was trying to champion interior design and um, reach a bigger audience in other countries. And we went on different trips. We went to Chicago, went to Tokyo, and that was great being a representative of that body. But more recently, I'm on the Committee for Diversity and Inclusion, which is great because what the BIID is doing is actually taking action. They did a survey. They realized that, and it's a small survey. I know it doesn't fully represent interior design in the UK, but it has some sort of um, position on it. And they realized that there isn't diversity or inclusion and we need to try and address that and help companies. So they did a survey and we've now put together um, sort of guidelines as to what companies can do. And that's been just sort of recently released. So I'm part of that committee that's helping that. And I think it's really important for companies to realise that things need to change, things need to improve. Um, there are opportunities for everybody and to be more inclusive. So BIID is fantastic and it's a really, really important organisation that brings designers together. Wonderful. Legacy, final question. Okay, legacy will be, yeah, Simon smiles a lot and he wears a lot of bright clothes. That's a big thing. <laughs> I'm known for colour, actually. And, yes, sociable, being sociable. Um, Isn't that interesting? So you want people to remember you. You're known for colour. 
I am known for colour, yes. I like to dress up. And I think that's something that um, I'm quite quite subdued today. But normally yeah. I've got quite bright oranges and blues and, um, and things like that. So, yeah, I'm known for... Your glasses. Yeah, the glasses are new, though. I'm known for standing out, I suppose, in a crowd because of what I'm wearing. But I enjoy it. I enjoy that. And that's another important thing I want to mention that I haven't mentioned before um, in terms of discrimination, how people were treating me. When I was um, working as a designer and I had my own company and I would go to design shows and events, I would be perhaps the only black person there at all. And it was quite disturbing and upsetting because you're thinking, I can't be the only person. But then as time went on, you know, and I thought I need to fit in, I need to fit in, I need to be like everybody else. And I would go to different things in London. And again, it would be the same. I'd be the only person there. And trying to fit in was never going to happen because I thought, well, I just don't look the same. So when I realised that, and I don't know whether there was a particular event that made me think this way, but as soon as I realised I'm not going to fit in and actually I should be happy about who I am, I started to enjoy it more. And so that, I think, might have been the turning point where I'm thinking, I'm going to dress up and stand out and have fun and then not even look back. Well, why do you think you were the only black person in the room? I think it's because... One, I have a sense of adventure, so I love the idea of travelling. So I would go to Stockholm, I'd go to Italy, I'd go to Tokyo. And um, maybe, you know, there's not so many people who have graduated in design who wanted to do that. But also, if you don't see people doing that, you don't do it yourself. So it's about role models. It's like any industry. Um, I mean, look at sport. You kind of need to have a role model to encourage yourself to go into an area. It's changed. It's got a lot better. I now go to events and there's a multitude of different people, all different genders, races, backgrounds, etc., which is fantastic. But it was definitely a thing when I would go somewhere and thinking, this can't be right. I can't be the only person that's black that's interested in this particular field that has come all this way. Um, and and it's all about communication too. So if people know that you're going, you can tell them and, and network and, and that can happen more easily now. So I think that showing people what you do and sharing it will encourage others to do the same. Good stuff. I just wish for the day that we see a human just for a, a personality. Yeah. I know I love your, your clothes are fabulous. I'm not going <laughs> to knock Paul Smith, but I just don't care. It's just... <laughs> When we see a human as just like a heart and yeah. a soul and, you know, a, you know, the vulnerability, passions, yeah. please. I know it'd be good when we don't have to speak about diversity because it's not a thing, basically. That would be great. So that's probably who I am now. I'm somebody who enjoys my environment, the industry a lot. Um, I, I love all the people in design. I've had a really good time in it. It's an industry I've tried to leave and it's, keep coming back in everything I've done with its recruitment, mentoring, um, you know, working for a supplier as a sharing manager, it's all been related to design. So it's in my blood. So now I embrace it in a very different way, in a way that's more positive because I feel I'm being myself. If people don't like me, then that's a personal thing. But generally, I like people. So um, part of who my, you know, part of what my identity is, is being dressed up to have fun you know with these silly edna glasses that people can't really see on the podcast but you know what i mean um it's, it's it is video as well yeah, okay. so you can see them but <laughs> so, that, yes, that was fun. your aha moment actually yeah. being comfortable in your own skin and saying actually i count my personality is pretty cool yeah well i didn't think that i just thought i need to i need to have an identity that i'm happy with and I don't want to be sort of smug about it, but I'm not going to be humble. I'm just going to have fun with it. So I like to wear different things to parties and events and that sort of thing and dress up and, and plan it all ahead and, and all that. And I think, yeah, what should I wear today? Oh, no, I'll wear that. And then my partner says, oh, I've got too many clothes. I think, yeah, but I've got lots of things to go to. So that's my justification. <laughs> so just just quickly, famous, like, standout outfit. Um, want to make a, okay, want to make a scene. No, no, want to make a really good first impression. I've got an emerald green Paul Smith suit um, that I would wear with an orange pocket square. That would make me stand out. Makes I, perfect sense to me. Yeah, I wore that at the 
um, surface design show, surface design awards as a host. So that sort of made me stand out. And I felt very good in it because of Paul. <laughs> mm. I'm not on first name terms anyway. Thank you, Paul Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Paul Smith, yeah. What a wonderfully, it, it, really interesting. Thank you for your time. Thank really, you really much. grateful really to you. I really enjoyed it. It's been really Oh, lovely. Thank you. If you've loved today's podcast as much as I have, please like and subscribe. I'm going to be here every Monday morning with more fabulous guests. Join us then. <laughs>